So welcome everybody uh, to what I think is our fourth uh, Sea Nature session now. And as uh, Philip mentioned just before the recording, we hope to do a couple more of these um, before having a break over the summer period. And for anybody that is new um, with us or is listening um, on a recording from our Facebook page, um, we're essentially just um, a group of people that are coming together to share knowledge and our enthusiasm for British wildlife and natural history. And we're run by the University of Salford, involving both staff and students, um, but also it's for anybody um, that has similar interests. So it's not exclusive um, to the University of Salford. So we have lots of guests um, and wonderful people joining us. Um, so if you're interested um, in becoming part of Sea Nature, please do feel free uh, to get in touch. And here is what we have planned for today. We tend to have the same format each week with occasional little twists and surprises in there. Um, so without further ado, I am just going to kick off because these sessions normally last around an hour or so. So we're keen to try and stick to time. And we always like to start off by finding out where everybody is listening from today. So if you're not familiar with Collaborate, you might notice a little pencil button just above the slide there. Please feel free to click on that button and to make a physical marking on that map uh, to show us where you're listening from today. And we know uh, we've got people here from outside of the UK, so please um, make your mark on that map too. Uh, the more detail, uh, the better. So we have somebody here from Italy. I think that's Almo. Um, Lots of marks being made there. That's fantastic. From all over. That's good. So we're spanning. We've got guests here from Scotland. Last week, our guest speaker was from Wales. Um, obviously, there's a lot of us northwest sort of Mancunians <laughs> within this talk. But what I'm really enjoying is seeing the, the real spread across different counties um, throughout England and throughout the UK. So that's really it's really important if we're discussing British wildlife and um, that we really get a spread um, of people getting involved so we can get a real feel for what our wildlife is doing on a bigger scale. So that's excellent. So thank you for that. And this week's challenge, they've been a bit too easy recently. Um, the what is it? OK, so that's all I'm going to show you. OK, so have a think. And by the end of the session, I will reveal what uh, animal that's the only clue I'll give you it's an animal it's not a plant um, what is it okay so just have a think throughout this session and at the end we will reveal the answer there okay so what is it okay so this is argu arguably the bit I look forward to the most is just a general catch up between us all now of what we've been seeing. Um, I guess we're still in lockdown, even though it's sort of slowly being eased now. Um, but generally, what are we all seeing out and about in terms of the wildlife? We're really we're transitioning now for into summer. Um, so I'm really keen to hear what everyone's been up to. So you can either raise your hand um, if you want to unmute yourself and speak out loud or feel free to put things in the chat box and hopefully um, other moderators. So Philip or Jamie um, can either pick it up or if I, if I don't see it, if I miss it. So I've got in the chat section from uh, Rob there, a buzzard flying at dusk. That's fantastic. I love, love raptors. Ursula says she's seen a pair of greater spotted woodpeckers. I mean, feel free, Rob and Ursula, if you want to expand on that, please unmute yourselves and tell us a bit more. So we've got Greg, tawny owls calling at night and a lizard orchid spotted out in the Cotswolds. So that's great. So this is actually a really good time for orchid spotting. And hopefully, um, you know, Greg gave us some really good insights last week into some of the orchids he'd been spotting. Um, we might get some more of that this week. Uh, little bee orchids growing next to the garage. Oh, uh, I think uh, bee orchids were the first orchid that sort of got me hooked, actually, um, thinking about it. Uh, I'll, I'll say out loud, I know it's been recorded and I, I can't, unfortunately can't disclose the site, but I've rediscovered night jars in my local area, which is a pretty, pretty big deal um, as a bird lover. So night jars is my highlight of the week. Um, anybody else want to share? And as I say, I do encourage if you want to unmute yourself and actually tell us about some of the things you've seen, that would be great too.
an emerging common hawker from David. Yeah, so this this was a real really good time for your Odinata, for your dragonflies and your damselflies. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm not seeing as many butterflies as I normally would at this time of the year. Um, has anybody else noticed that at all? I mean, please feel free to to pipe up. It might be that I'm just going insane or I'm focusing too much on moths, but I'm really not seeing the usual abundance of butterflies that I normally would. No, I agree. I agree. I've, I've seen very few around and very few in the last couple of weeks in particular. Mm. So it's been a good year for um, small tortoiseshell, though, especially where I've been. There's been sort of clouds of them along the bank, along the nettles. Um, mm. Definitely seen yeah. marble whites and stuff. I don't know. This week, see how their butterflies are doing up there. Usually, it's a good number. Um, yeah, I would definitely agree. I'm seeing small tortoise shells and uh, peacocks and things like that, but I just think it's the sheer numbers that that's alarmingly different to previous years. Uh, diversity seems to be fairly similar, but it's just the numbers. I don't know. Maybe they're just having a really bad year. I don't know. That's interesting. That that other people are finding it and we're not all in the same area. Um, does anyone have anything else to add before I move on from this section? Jamie's asked um, you, David, if you have any photos of your emerging common hawker. Uh, no, I don't. I've got, um, I've got an excised um excised skin from uh, another one that we found in the same pond um but no i didn't i tried to film it and it came out rubbish to be honest here <laughs> i saw a four a four spotted chaser i'll put a photo on facebook that was lovely yeah if anybody does take any really cool photos please either send them to us or just whack them directly on our facebook page um, it's a really nice way of staying in touch in between these sessions um, and I'm always a sucker for a great photo so please do keep that in mind. Um, actually I've moved on a little bit too keenly there so you might have noticed on the slide um, there's a lecturer within our department, Alan, um, he's been doing a lot of uh, camera trapping in his garden and for anyone that does use Twitter um, on here I'm a big Twitter user, I, I love the love it as a social media platform but Alan's been sharing some really good camera trap footage just from his back garden of, and he loves small mammals that's his thing I guess you know some of us it's moths orchids his is small mammals and he got an excellent video where, where within the same uh, short clip he had multiple different species of small mammals all coming to the same trap um, so some really good footage. So do check that out. Unfortunately, I, I couldn't find a way to import that video um, in there. But please do do have a look. Um, and just uh, just seen a couple more comments. So from Fiona, Fiona's put a little video of ground nesting bees on the Facebook page and welcomes any IDs. So for any uh, budding entomologists out there, please do check the Facebook page and help Fiona out. And then Eleanor, we have red-tailed bumblebees in last year's blue tip bird box. Amazing. Yeah, it's amazing actually when I when I do a lot of pulley ringing, so ringing uh, chicks, often or not, I think it's probably about 50% of the time it's not birds in the boxes when I open them up and I get to find lots of other amazing things. Um, so that's cool. Thank you for sharing that. So we always like to provide a link to a webcam each week. Um, I know Philip's particularly fond of this because it's a, a chance for you to sort of take a time out to really connect with nature. Um, I guess it's kind of like very in a, in a sort of meditation kind of sense. You just get to just get lost in this video where you feel very close and connected to nature even though you're sat in your living room or on your bed or wherever you're, you're sort of streaming this from.
So just picking up on Eleanor's comments, uh, these are other sets and you might be familiar with them from the RSPB logo and that's because quite a while ago they were really not doing well, they were really in decline here in Britain but they've since uh, recovered and are now doing uh, considerably well. And just to also support what Jamie said, uh, Cly is a fantastic uh, reserve, um, really recommend it. Um, if you're a member of the Norfolk Wildlife Trust, it's obviously uh, free to go to, but if not, um, there's a small fee, but the visitor centre alone um, is worth it. Uh, scones are particularly um, amazing, <laughs> but no, it's a really fantastic uh, reserve. So thank you for that link that was kindly provided uh, by Philip. Yes, very good cakes, Fiona. Very good cakes. There's also a Clyde Deli, which is just down the road as well, which does uh, incredible pork pies. But enough of that. I've already had my lunch, so I will I'll try and move on from that. Okay, so I'm now going to hand over to Greg. He's been giving us weekly updates of the wildlife he's been seeing because he's been to see a lot of it and it's very interesting so greg if i can hand over to you and take it away okay uh, the first thing i'd like to say is um placement i should be uh going to hopefully at the end of july for a couple of months at sandwich bay bird observatory they had a very rare moth fourth record in 50 years uh of this moth it's called a black v um, it's an immigrant species and it's this lovely sort of white sort of a bit mint mint colored there um but with obviously this distinctive mark um and that's the kind of thing they get so hopefully when i'm there over well if i get there over the uh, autumn they should get some nice migratory species um it's a great spot for moths uh get stuff like beautiful marbles death yes just some of the species they've had over the past couple of years um but also they're good for orchids uh orchid out in the cotswolds uh sandwich bay has got one of the highest lizard orchid in the country i think about 90 percent of the total uk population so um this is what a lizard orchid looks like it's got these and it's got these wonderful sort of tongue-like flowers which is how it's got the name lizard orchid it's a big orchid uh possibly one of the largest in the UK. Um, it's got these wonderful sort of spirally uh, tongues um, that go further down. Um, possibly one of the most magnificent orchids. Um, this week, moth-wise, it's been quite quiet, probably because of the, uh, the storms and stuff. Oh. Um, so this is uh, the swallowtail moth that uh, I discussed last week. I managed to get a picture of one finally. It flew around the trap, never goes in. But it's always a nice moth to see. Um, great colour, quite a large moth, um, large geometric, but it's, it's nice to see. Um, and uh, this is one that I only had once last year, so I'll be interested to see if I get it again. This is a uh, light arches, um, and the moth to the right of it is dark arches. Um, light arches look a little bit sort of as though they're a bit worn. Uh, I don't seem to get them much. I think they're quite a common species in the UK, but I only had one last year, so whether I'll catch another one, I'm not sure. Of. I've already had my quota for light arches this year. Um, dark arches are definitely, I'll get plenty of them, and I've been getting plenty of them over the past few days. Um, the other night I had a good turnout for hawk moths, so uh, I think I had about seven in the end, but I just took about four and then a privet hawk moth as well on the finger i've had um i think i had two private <laughs> hawk moths and then seven elephant hawk moths uh that night uh, so that's pretty good i've also had so i just had two quite interesting new well but four interesting new species um this one's quite interesting this is box tree moth uh now this is a species that's colonized the uk in recent years and over in europe it can plants i don't think it's a problem over here but it's quite striking um when they're fresh they can have this sort of purple sheen to their wings this one was obviously not quite fresh um but it's quite a nice stunning little moth and there's another species that's quite similar to it 
that's solid white, but that similar sort of shape called, uh, I think it's Palpia vitrealis, which is a immigrant often from the continent as well, um, that's worth looking out for. Um, and then on the side of the track the other night, I had this moth, which I thought at first was like sort of spotless white ermine, but further looks uh, actually proved it was a white satin, uh, which is quite a common species, again, across the country. And it's got this sort of satiny look to it. Um, again, that's, that was a new one for the garden for me. I don't think I had one last year, so that's quite a nice find. Um, at first, I thought it might be something called a water ermine, which is a bit like a white ermine, but a little bit less spots. But the complete lack of spots made me realise it was a white satin. Um, common footman. This is another quite uh common species i get in my trap uh the footmen are these sort of moths which have this uh shape um i remember when i was at sandwich bay last year lots of people Tory footmen uh which sort of to the to those that didn't know looks just a bit like a bit of a boring moth but everyone was quite excited to catch one um but this is the common uh it's orange and this gray thing if you're in a woodland area, you might get orange footman, which is just a solid orange uh, moth of this kind of shape. Um, and here's a, I think this is a sycamore, which uh, there's two moths it could be, so poplar grey or sycamore. And I think sort of uh, less distinctive marking makes it a sycamore. Um, this one's clinging to the wall, never went in the trap, but uh, it, it's, it stayed there all night. Um, when I went out in the morning, it was still there, which is... So I had, to, I had to move it because there's been a magpie I've been noticing. I, I was looking up through the moth trap the other day and I looked up and I saw this magpie on the roof across the road looking in my direction. I think they wait for me to sort of dump the moths and try and take them or at least feed the cat and steal his food. Um, crafty birds. Um, so, yeah, that, that's probably the, the only new species I've had this week. I did have a um, damselfly in my conservatory. I don't know how it got in. I'm not sure which species either. Uh, I'll have to try and work it out unless someone knows. Oh, just had thunder outside. Um, whether I'll be setting the trap much this week, I'm not sure. It looks as though it's going to be thundery. Quite warm tonight, so it might be worth giving it a go because moths love the sort of slight humidity or in the air when sort of, uh, there's warm, sort of stormy weather. So might get a big catch, I'm not sure. Um, but that's kind of it. It's been... Not too busy a week, but now we're in the height of the moth season. Hopefully we'll get some more species. Ah, blue tail, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, as, as, once you know what that was. Anyway, um, that's me, Dan. No, that was great. Thanks, Greg. I wanted to ask, actually, the trapping you do, did you make the trap yourself or is it a bought one? Um, it's, it's from... Uh, and that if you want to do trapping, it's better to make one because they're quite expensive. Uh, that's not a particularly powerful trap. It's a 20 watt actinic heath, uh, and that still costs about 100 pounds. Um, if you wanted to get really serious and get a, a 125 watt Robinson trap, it would be cost you could set you back at least 300 or so. So, mm -hmm. yeah, if not more. So. But there's good guides on butterfly conservation for making your own trap, and it's quite a good thing to do. Um, it's a bit addictive, addictive, really, sort of seeing what's new, what comes out. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm more than happy to put on the Facebook page if there is anybody that's been to the last few sessions and thought, you know what, moths are actually pretty awesome. We want to have a go at trapping. I'm more than happy to engage with people via email or on Facebook and give some advice about that. And maybe yeah, we'll be cheekily volunteer greg to offer maybe offer his services for that too because we could talk so every week in c nature we like to invite a guest um one of the moderators will we'll bring somebody in that's um external to the university um and this week um it was dr robert yellow who recommended our speaker so i'm going to hand over to robert to give a quick introduction yeah it's my my great pleasure and honor to introduce um david o'brien to, to everybody else here um as we see on this slide david is a a manager at scottish natural heritage is based in inverness i met david about 10 years ago we must be now with a conference and we just started talking and we are since then 
um, loosely, but, but I dare to say quite successfully, um, collaborating on a range of different projects, all revolving around amphibian conservation in, in, in Scotland, uh, Scottish Highlands in particular. And, and perhaps just as a last thing, everything culminated this year um, in so far that David is now also our um, PhD student at Salford. And he's the first ever person in our area who conducts a PhD by published work. So he's just publishing and has um, accumulated a lot of scientific work, which now submits um, as a PhD with us in Salford, either this year or early next year. Enough from my side. Over to you, David. Right, good. Thank you for joining me on a virtual walk around one of my neighbour's farms. Uh, you're lucky it's a virtual walk because it's hammering down with rain here. Uh, yesterday I managed to get completely soaked as well, but that's due to the fact that my uh, boots have split and a well is filled up with water, which is um, not too bad because, of course, the Highlands of Scotland are famous for being very, very warm, and so your boots filling with, with water is not a problem at all. So this is a working farm. It's uh, mainly for farming sheep. Um, and uh, we started working with Duncan and Marjorie, who own the farm, about five, six years ago. I've known them since they moved up here. And it is a productive farm. It is an economic farm. It is not a nature reserve. However, it is very good for nature. Uh, and just as I was walking across the field, um, going past all these sheep, in the sky we had red kites, it's a great site for red kites, they roost in the nearby trees and certainly in this part of Scotland they're very popular particularly with the farmers because they see them as sort of refuse collectors. When the sheep are giving birth these things swoop down, they clear up the afterbirth um, and any other bits of potential carrion which otherwise would go to um, crows, buzzards or foxes which are less popular with uh, farmers. So Duncan and Mar uh, Marjorie who own this farm and their neighbours on the other side who are called the McDonald's, so yes old McDonald does indeed have a farm, uh, they've done quite a lot of work with, with kites and uh, it's you always see them when you're there. Another bird that we generally see there is, is the raven I get these flying over the garden and uh, I do have a soft spot for ravens. Farmers tend not to like them so much, um, but particularly when they're displayed early in the season, uh, they're very loud, very acrobatic, they're very bright creatures, they can count. Uh, and the way we know this is if you have a hide, ravens are used to being persecuted so they don't like people. If you have a hide and two people go in and one person leaves, most birds will think, oh right, they've gone now, and they'll they'll land there. Ravens, however, won't be fooled by that. And it takes, I remember it's eight or nine. So basically eight people have to walk in and seven walk out before they get confused, which is quite good. Um, which when you think about it, I mean, could you, would you necessarily know to count to eight if you're watching things? So they're, they're very bright birds, um, a bit maligned. Um, but they're doing very well around here and it's always a pleasure to see them. One of the other birds, and something a lot more commoner uh, that we have around here is the pied wagtail. This is quite a young bird. Um, she's quite light grey on the back rather than black and the tail's relatively short. Um, pied wagtails are one of these species that I'm going to sound really old now, that used to see them all over the place and now they are not doing so well in agricultural settings and a lot of that seems to be due to the amount of ivermectin that uh, are put in particularly cattle so that's a, a, an anti-helminthic a worming drug which is great for making the cattle healthy but fortunately when the, the cow pack comes out the other end of the cow um, it's toxic to most invertebrates and therefore toxic to the and therefore there's no feeding opportunity for the things that would, would feed on it. Um, and there was a, a site recently where it's just, I'll say you're knee deep in cow, cow shit basically because nothing's breaking down because of the, the dosages of ivermectin they put in there. But not so here, they've got a really good balance uh, of, uh, of how they're managing the farm. Uh, one of the keys I always think is how many of these things you've got 
uh, this is on the left of the picture there's some yellow flag iris uh, and they're a beautiful flower but particularly in Scotland if you've got uh, marshy spots that are almost entirely yellow flag iris you've got a problem and the reason for that is yellow flag is is uh, unpalatable to to cattle and to sheep so if a site is overgrazed this will all this will be all you're left with so in an ideal site like like Duncan and Marjorie's farm you'll have some uh, yellow flag iris which is great it is a beautiful beautiful flower uh, but it won't take over so as you can see in this picture there's a, a mixture of uh, of ferns and um, I'm guessing buttercup because it's a bit blurry in there mealwort in the water and uh, and rushes and grass so you've got a lot going on there it's not being too heavily grazed which is a very good sign as far as I'm concerned um, most of the margins of the fields are rough grass uh, what's known as unimproved grassland and agricultural parlance which is a bit harsh I always think because it's the unimproved stuff that's often the best all right I want to imagine that we're we've gone forward in time a bit to August and this is one of the species that really benefits from a tussocky rough grassland so scotch argus um, there are argus species in in England as well we've got what used to be called the Durham argus it's now the northern argus which we get in my my native uh northeast of england but these are a, a super little flies but bizarrely they hate wind how they survive in scotland uh i i don't know but uh you tend not to see them unless it's really calm and still anyway i've been talking about um duncan and marjorie's farm and how good it is but the best bit and this ties in with robert i should have met robert was very coy oh we met at a conference yeah we met in a pub uh, on the evening after uh, uh, he'd been speaking. So virtually all of our meetings subsequent to this have revolved around pubs and other forms of alcohol, I should say this. Anyway, one of the things that came out upon these collaborative uh, ideas was working with some local landowners to make a whole load of ponds for great crested newts. I won't go into the detail of that. There are several papers on it, which you can look up. But this is a series of of some of those ponds that are uh, on Duncan and Marjorie's land. Um, uh, all that is up under beer mats now. See if the pointy thing, will the pointy thing work, do we think? Oh no, pointy thing, pointy thing, will it point? Oop. Yeah, there you go. That splodge, honest, is a red kite. It just goes to prove that you pretty much can't take a photograph of sky around here without a red kite or a buzzard or an osprey in it. Okay. Um, in there you can see that we've got um, some quite shallow ponds there's four of them there another three of them further down and they're great for amphibians which is what they're built for um, now in the top picture is the pointy again you can see here I think that's working a folded over potomac eaten leaf and here you can see once it's been unfolded and in there is a great crested newt egg they wrap them in the leaves to protect them from predation um you can have a you can do this yourself if you want a bit of a laugh you can get a balloon cover it in glue and wrap it in a newspaper using your feet uh, and that's what female great crested newts in effect are doing except they're doing it underwater of course uh so they'll they'll lay uh typically seven or eight eggs in a night can be more than this until they've laid uh a good two to three hundred eggs and then uh, you can see the adult uh, here so well such a, a late immature female that we just found under a piece of sacking so they're doing really well this is a great success story um for which uh robert and i take full credit as do duncan and marjorie he now i now tell him he's got more newts than he has sheep he's quite happy with that one of the things when you do conservation work of this sort of course is you benefit other uh, species as well and we've got a whole suite of amphibians these are a couple of male palmate newts that I unceremoniously hoiked out and stuffed on some sphagnum palmate newts and common frogs were amongst the first species to colonize these ponds uh, in total we made 25 ponds and 24 of them have been colonized by amphibians the other pond was a complete um, cock up I think that's the most polite word I can describe it uh, but more of that later but we're very pleased this has been very successful 
and now over a percent of the Highland Great Crested Newt population, and it's genetically slightly different. Again, read that up. Um, over 10% are now on in ponds that we've created through our project, so we're very pleased. Also benefits of the species. We talked a little bit about Odonata earlier. I did not take these pictures. They are far too good to be my pictures. Uh, you've got a common blue damselfly on, on the left and a uh, large red on the right. Large red is one of the first damselflies to come out in the spring. Uh, there are quite a lot of them around up here uh, right now and uh, pretty much any reasonably clean water body will have them in it. Now I'm running to the towards the end of my allotted time. I did say that we had 25 ponds created and 24 of them are great for amphibians. The other one, we had a complete communications meltdown. Instead of it being good for amphibians, we ended up with this sphagnum bog that is so acid you could dip your chips in it, which is useless for amphibians. It is, however, good for another species, which is this. The, this is a white-faced garter. It's very rare. Um, so we've accidentally created habitat for a very rare species. So we're quite pleased about that. Um, but we'll be studying that and seeing how it gets on. What I would say before I close is if you ever want to come up to the Highlands, um, I'm happy to show you around. Um, I can hear my wife in the background who'll be saying, oh, for God's sake, I don't want to stay. Um, but we've got some lovely sites, particularly here on the Black Isle, and uh, we've also got a brewery. So what more could you want? Uh, thanks, as we say in Gaelic, uh, tapalev. I hope you enjoyed that, and I will now hand you back. That was fantastic, uh, David. Thank you so much. Uh, every week we have what we call our nature video showcase. Um, and what we've been doing is we've very kindly um, had volunteers, master students that have made some pretty fantastic uh, videos, often using small compact cameras or even their mobile phones uh, to sort of capture some of the British wildlife um, and Eleanor has very kindly uh, contributed uh, this week's video. Yeah, uh, I can introduce it. So um, I'm a master's student, as Danny said, I'm on the wildlife documentary production course. And this film was produced literally in my back garden. Um, just I kind of wanted something to do throughout lockdown, which would sort of enhance my production skills. So this is the result. Um, uh, sorry about the quality in places, but I hope you all enjoy. Late May. The breeding season is in full swing. Parents are busy rearing young, and there are signs of new life everywhere you look. A lack of rain in recent weeks means the ground is dry and sources of water are scarce. This garden pond is a welcome sight. A warm spring day shows off the abundance of life within it. A common pond skater, balanced on the surface of the water. The hairs on their feet enable them to detect vibrations. This leads them to other pond skaters, or to prey which fall into their pond. Something this size is a feast for the new hatchlings. A wood pigeon. A common sight across gardens in the UK. He is building a nest. He takes branches to the female and keeps watch for any potential rivals. To mark his territory, he regularly vocalises his familiar sound. All of this is thirsty work. Pigeons are among the very few birds that take in water through the holes in their beaks. Collared doves can do exactly the same. There are speculations about why this behaviour is unique to these few species. 
other birds don't do it. Instead, they scoop water into their beaks. This adaptation originated from their descendants who once lived in deserts. In environments where water is scarce and predators are abundant, uptake of water must be fast and efficient. This wall of ivy is singing. A family of house sparrows have made it their home. A patch of freshly dug soil looks very appealing in this heat. Dust baths help maintain feather condition by removing parasites and absorbing excess oils. There's room for all the family. However, intruders are not welcome. But, there's trouble. Their home has been destroyed. They must find a new place to nest and quickly if they stand any chance of breeding this year. After many weeks without it, the arrival of rain is welcome. This damp weather doesn't stop even the smallest of species. Wasps. Despite being seen as a pest, their role within ecosystems is vital. They are top predators in the invertebrate world and without them we would be overrun with spiders and flies. Wood is vital for their survival. But why? They take wood and chew it up with the saliva in their mouths. This is then used to construct their nests. At a time when wildlife is struggling more than ever, we must make space for nature where we can. This can be as simple as putting up feeders or building a bird box. Whatever we do, we must make space because when we do, nature flourishes. Yeah, honestly, Eleanor, I, I do think so. I think there was a very clear message. That's what I like most about it, um, that we have to make space and that nature will flourish if we make the effort uh, to give them that space. And anybody else got any comments for Eleanor on that? So we've got, I can read some out. So Fiona said she really enjoyed seeing the sparrows. Yeah, it was great, especially when they were having their dirt baths. Yeah. Uh, Jamie says, wonderful video, Eleanor. Wasps battering the garden furniture at his house this morning. Thank you all very much. And obviously I've had some great teachers <laughs> with constructing storylines and everything. So yeah, it all came together quite well. So I was quite happy with it as well. Excellent. And, and thank you so much for volunteering to let us all watch it. I'm sure it's sure. <laughs> quite a great thing to do, um, but um, it's fantastic. It's really good. Um, so, yeah, every, anybody who wants to give any further comments to Eleanor, please put them in the chat. Um, and I'm sure she can uh, respond um, and we will continue on. But yeah, fantastic. So. I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Ursula Hurley. Um, so we introduced this new section last week, um, wanting to introduce more arts, um, nature and the arts uh, to our Sea Nature sessions. And I know it was pr pretty popular. Um, so Ursula, I've included the slides in this main presentation. So all you need to do is just sort of continue flicking through. So I'll hand over to you. 
That's great. Thanks very much, Danny. And um, it's a real pleasure to take over from Eleanor. Um, as a creative writer, I wanted to say what an excellent eye you have for drama and the way that you you picked out those dramas just going on in the garden around us. And I thought that was was really strong. And also what came out was that making space and that that call to action. Um, that was something that I wanted to pick up on as well is how creative outputs like film or like writing can actually have an impact and, and make real change for wildlife. Um, so this is where I wanted to start um, with a few lines from Roger Deakin and his sort of collection of, of diary and impressionistic writing called Walnut Tree Farm. And I was really struck by his question, why write? A writer needs a strong passion to change things, not just to reflect or report on them as they are. And I think we saw Eleanor's film doing something very similar. Myers to promote a feeling for the importance of trees through a greater understanding of them. So that most people don't just think of trees as they mostly do now, but of each individual tree and each kind of tree. Um, so that, that call there to think of trees individually, not just as some amorphous mass that shares our world. So I'd like to invite, if anyone's got any, any special trees or any particular trees that they have um, memories of or an attachment to, uh, do feel free to put that in the chat box as we go and maybe we can share some impressions and I'll come to my special tree um, in a couple of minutes. So we move on to another quotation from Roger Deakin, and I find this really interesting. He says, if you want to know what it's like to be a tree, sleep with a cat on your bed and feel it manoeuvring and exploring your curves and hollows for the most comfortable nest. And I find that really interesting because he takes the human out of the, the hierarchy. We often have this very anthropocentric view which puts the human at, you know at the center where the most important thing in the world um, and I thought this was a really interesting change of perspective um, that imagining our way into the being of a tree which can help us to have empathy and of course empathy then perhaps makes us more protective or more appreciative but that idea if anyone's ever been um, trampled by a cat then we, we get a kind of sense of what that must be like uh, being subject to other creatures kind of moving around all over us. Um, so I, I appreciated that change in perspective and stopping, stopping that sense that we are the most important things in the world and stepping out of our own embodied humanity and thinking about the experience of other life forms. Um, so what I'm going to do in a moment is read um, one of my poems about a tree that, that meant something to me. Um, Rob has put there, he has a huge willow tree in the garden. Yeah, willow trees are amazing, aren't they? They've got such, such presence. Um, and Jamie there, a stunning oak tree. Um, yeah, amazing. I remember when I was an undergrad, we had this enormous uh, purple beech tree and it got struck by lightning um, in my final year and they had to take it down. Um, that was that was very, very dramatic. Um, but I'm going to read a, a poem now and it's kind of a, a tribute to a tree that is no more. And if anyone's the campus at Salford, um, when I started work there many years ago, I had an office in Crescent House and there was a courtyard that was all kind of glassed in. Um, and there was a tree in the middle of the courtyard and I'd sit there looking from my office window at this tree, um, being unable to interact with it, but looking at it when I should have been answering emails or being productive. So I'm going to finish by, by reading this poem. Tree, you are absolute, bowed by the trial of your own strength, catching snow and fog and telephone lines in your complicated crown. Two magpies huddle in your branches. You hold the blue fire of their wings, cradle their nest, an oyster proudly bearing its pearl. They are safe in your limbs. Your limbs, which only time can weaken, the slow passage of seizure, seasons, opening fissures in your gnarled, dun bark. 
weaving brocades of moss and lichen. And yet you are young still, your roots caressing wires and worms, tangling with steel and concrete, tapping sewage pipes buried safe beneath paving slabs. If I could touch you, tree, if I could touch you, then I would know your breathing leaves. So I'll finish that there. Just see, um, oh, Fiona's telling us about a dwarf weeping mulberry tree and how lovely to leave that for the birds. I think that's a lovely gesture, sharing it with, with birds in the garden. Um, yeah, you've given me an idea now. I think I want a dwarf mulberry tree as well. So thank you for that suggestion. Thank you for listening. And I hope, again, that opened a slightly more reflective space. And I'll, I'll hand back to Danny now. Yes, thank you so much for that, Ursula. I thought that was really great. I particularly liked a complicated crown, really uh, <laughs> broke out to me. I um, hope everybody else enjoyed that too. Um, please leave your comments uh, for Ursula in the chat area and I'm sure she can respond to them. So I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Jamie Gundry. Thank you, Danny. Um, so um, just see if that's working. Yes. Yeah, so again, just a snapshot of local insect life in in the Chester area. Um, again, all with an affordable camera. They're about 130 pounds online. So very, very affordable. Um, and yeah, it, it's just really good. Been really good fun just getting out with a camera. Very good for the soul. Otherwise, you spend all your time in front of a computer screen. So I was hunkered down waiting for damselflies. I noticed a pair of beetles mating on a strip of reed. Soon they were joined by more and more unwanted company, which made me laugh. The males have a gold sheen in the abdomen and a slightly pitted texture. Um, I think this would make them very hard to be waterproof, but apart from that, I can't see any benefit. So it may well be to impress the females. Um, and next we have a group of flies right on the surface of the water. Um, and just if, if you hunker down, there's a, a huge amount of, um, of insect life just in this tiny reed bed. It used to be a golf course and it's, I think it's been rewilding for about five years now. It, it's a fantastic spot. If you want to know where it is, just drop me an email. Okay. Um, on my way out, I had to be, be at Sainsbury's, I think. Um, I noticed lots and lots of peacock butterfly caterpillars, really devastating the, the local nettles. Um, and I was able to zoom a long way in and you can see the mandibles and the big, um, big chewing musculature in the head and the spines for fending off predators and parasitoids. And if the peacock butterfly is anything like any like most caterpillars it will probably be very regularly attract attacked by parasitoid wasps these were getting on for full size maybe 50 or 60 millimeters long moving on to the next slide it's the same caterpillar this is a close-up of the legs um, these are actually the false legs they have four pairs of these towards the back of the animal and again you can see the spines at the bottom of the frame but another thing I like here is you can see the trichomes of the nettles um, at the top of the image. Um, you can see, I'm going to see if I can, yeah, I can indicate it here. Um, the, you have these large trichomes, which would be evolved to fend off um, vertebrates like us. And you have small trichomes, which are evolved to fend off invertebrates. And I think we've probably all been stung by nettles before. Um, if I'd been paying attention or more attention, I, I, sh I should have got some close ups of the trichomes themselves. But to be honest, I only noticed them after I got the picture home. Um, so we talked last week about stacking images. And as always, please drop me if you drop me an email if you have any questions. Um, but the core of it is to take a set of photos of the same subject in the same pose with the focus at different distances from the camera and to merge them later. But as they say, garbage in, garbage out. And I was failing entirely to achieve this with this lovely green bottle fly when it started to bend its head all over the place to groom. So I've included a non-stacked image of this. 
um, you can see how flexible the head is. Um, not only is this useful for grooming, but they can turn the head to left or right. And when they are maneuvering, they will try and keep the head completely vertical to reduce the visual flow of objects past the head. It's the same reason that a ballerina will, when she does a jump and spin, will keep the head still for as long as possible. OK, and finally, um, and this is one of the we've got a few shots here. This is one of the disasters at the start of the session. I had a go at photographing hoverflies in flight. Now, there's several problems here. Um, they're a tiny object against a, a dark background. Um, you need to underexpose a lot so that the subject is correctly exposed and actually focusing on them is incredibly hard. So initially, I tried to use the autofocus, and as you can see, I had a few disasters, slowly getting better. Um, but then I realized that this really wasn't going to work, so I worked out that you could focus the camera at a certain point and then engage what's called manual focus, which in this case means it won't focus at all. And this means that you can choose, say, 100 millimeters from the camera and then just aim it and shoot and hope for the best. For this kind of shot, you really need about three stops, so minus three stops of exposure compensation. And as you can see in the details, you can't get that with this camera. So I've had to do quite a lot of, of, of fiddling around with the images afterwards. Um, but in the end, it, it worked OK, or at least as well as could be expected. This shows the abstract effects you can get, the wing sort of painting itself in the in the air. It also shows that using a neighbor's car as a backdrop is a disaster. But finally, I got somewhere and this is kind of what I was aiming for. So these are about 12 millimeters long. Um, these are one of my PhD subjects. This is a male. You can tell because he's got big eyes that meet in the middle and he will be beating his wings at between 180 and 250 wing beats a second. That's the um, the woodshed in the background. Um, it's a little bit overexposed, but not a disaster. So they're beautiful, beautiful things. And once I finally cracked it, this one isn't sharp, but I like the um, the kind of double ghost effect of the wings. If you look at the the um, the shutter speed is a, a 320th of a second, it's really not enough to freeze the action. But it does mean that you get um, you get this double image. But there were hundreds and hundreds of shots that I had to throw away. Um, and finally, this is what they look like when they're not flying around. This was yesterday morning, um, quite early on, and this one was very, very patient as I got to within a few inches. And I could use autofocus again. And I, this was four images stacked together. What you do find with this camera, and the same with probably any compact camera, is you get a lot of noise if you don't go at the minimum ISO. So this is 800 ISO, which is a little bit high, and all the um, all the detail of the eye has pretty much been replaced by noise. Um, but you can't have everything, I guess. So one piece of advice with these is to keep an eye on the ISO because um, it can be difficult. But apart from that, it's a cracking camera um, and thoroughly recommended. I think that's all from me now. Yep. So um, thank you for listening, and please do drop me an email if you have any photographic photographic questions. I'll hand back to Danny now. Thank you very much for that, Jamie. Some more fantastic shots. Uh, makes me certainly more interested in flies, that's for sure. Um, so yeah, any photography questions, please put them in the chat area for Jamie. And that brings us to the last section of today's talk. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Professor Rob Young, who's going to fill us in on some cool stuff that we might have missed that's been online this week. Over to you, Rob. OK, so first of all, this week's app, I found this app called Leaf Snap, which is really good for identifying trees. Uh, it does require you to actually collect a leaf and put it on a white background. But then inside the app, you can take a photo. It'll send it to a server and then it will be automatically identified. The app was originally developed in North America. 
but has now got the database from the Natural History Museum in London loaded up into it. So it's constantly getting better and better at helping us identify plants here in the UK, which for somebody like me as a zoologist is very helpful because I'm not very good on plants. Next thing, um, new story that really caught my eye was the green recovery, a demand from leading charities for a green recovery. Because obviously now we're in a unprecedented situation where we can actually change the way we live and make major changes which were never imaginable. And this is not just being promoted by organizations which you would expect, such as Irish PB, but also by diverse organizations such as the Women's Institute. So this is a new story from The Guardian with all these charities um, clubbing together to demand that we have a green recovery, that we don't go back down the way that we've gone in the past so that we can obviously have better conditions for wildlife and of course ourselves in this country. And finally, kind of inspired a little bit by Ursula, the other, the resource I put on this week is not so much a resource, but something that's very enjoyable to listen to. I don't know if any of you know the rhyme of the ancient mariner. You probably all know the expression, somebody shot an albatross, which comes from the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Well, this is the big read. And in this big read, 40 different um, people, such as actors, how are reading passages of the rhyme of the ancient mariner. It's actually one of the longest poems in um, the English language. It takes about an hour to listen to the whole thing, but you can listen to it in component pieces one by one. And a lot of the themes about humans and the planet and what we're doing are all covered in the actual rhyme of the ancient mariner. So something when you've got a bit of time to listen to and reflect on. And I think I'll stop there for today. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rob. Uh, he, he's absolutely amazing at getting back to me with these links to news stories and apps and resources. Uh, they seem to be never ending and it's fantastic. So thank you so much. OK, so to bring it to a close, I can't possibly leave you all uh, without revealing what the what is it challenge was at the start. So does anybody want to be brave enough uh, to share what they think this is in the chat area. So Greg says Kestrel, David says Kestrel, Fiona says Kestrel. It seems to be a unanimous answer going on. Is somebody going to mix it up and pop pheasant in there or something? Almost Kestrel, male specifically. Very good. OK, so the big reveal is, yeah, it's a Kestrel. Maybe there's some too many budding ornithologists in this group. I thought that was a bit trickier um, this week, but maybe, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, need to go harder next week, but well done everybody. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, the European uh, kestrel, um, a falcon, pointed wings, long tail, um, probably most familiar with seeing it hovering on the side of a road. Um, numbers declined in the 70s, probably due, are likely due to changes um, in farming. Um, so it's now on the amber list. But yeah, absolutely beautiful bird. So well done. OK, so we'll bring it to a close. So um, I mean, Philip, do tell me if I'm right here. The next meeting is same time uh, next week on the Wednesday um, at two o'clock. And we'll be having a guest talk um, from Dr. Tim uh, Cockrell from Falmouth University, um, kindly nominated uh, by Jamie. And uh, Tim, um, he's a zoologist, a broadcaster and a photographer. Um, so I'm sure it will be a very exciting talk um, that focuses um, on life, uh, biodiversity and things like that. So very exciting talk. Uh, check out our Facebook page. I've mentioned it a few times um, because we're new. We're a new group. And whilst we are going to stop in a couple of weeks time, um, that's just the end of this series. The hope is this will be a more long term thing. And we want you all to get involved as much as you can. Thank you to everybody that contributes to these sessions. So for this week in particular, Greg, Eleanor, Ursula, Jamie and Rob um, and Robert for nominating um, our guest speaker as well. So, yep, big 
big thanks to David um, for joining us today um, from sunny Scotland. Um, and, and yes, and that's it from uh, myself and Philip. So